Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, cruise control. It's the moment you take your foot off the accelerator and your car surely and calmly coasts down the highway. But when it comes to our lives, cruise control is more often than not our default setting. It's when the status quo is simply too comfortable and the idea of challenging yourself is really an unconvincing prospect. I'm a third year undergraduate software engineering student at the university and I can tell you cruise control is all too familiar for me. The thing about university is that for most people, they consider it a symbol of liberal action or thought. But from my experience, university is sometimes the most conservative platform when it comes to delving into the things that really inspire you. All I wanted to do originally was get some good grades, get some good marks in a course, get a nice degree, have a good job. I spent a large part of my degree on cruise control. And that's what university became. It became putting my aspirations on hold because until I graduated, I was just a student. But then something changed. And this year, myself and a bunch of students who are now part of my team, we broke a world record for the fastest electric vehicle over 500 kilometers. And you could say that now I feel a little bit different towards cruise control. I guess, where does this start? So every story has a beginning. And my one began in the first week of university. I heard about this solar car team called SunSwift. And one day I decided to go for a walk, head down to their workshop and check it out. And down there I met a man named Sam Patterson. He was the leader of the team at the time. And he showed me around the workshop. He said, you know, come and check out this place. He took me inside and I saw this rustic looking building, um, which looks terrifying, but to most engineers, it's probably a little dream of theirs. And he said, all right, so now that you've seen this, let's go check out the solar car. Now, at the time, the team had been working on the fourth solar car called Ivy. So he took me out the back to this rustic, minimalistic trailer, and he popped it open, and inside was Ivy. And this isn't just any solar car, but at the time, it was the fastest solar car in the world. And I just got mind blown by this idea that a bunch of students who had, you know, underslept, they didn't look like they really knew what they were doing, had built this car. And they were doing it in their spare time with very little money, and that was about it. They were only a couple of years older than me. But I did what most other students do when you see the car. I turned around and I went home. I went on cruise control. A few weeks later, I met some other students that said to me, hey, do you want to start a company? It's going to be about changing the way we think and deal with food. We're going to connect people that eat with, connect, connect people, that eat with people who want to eat. And I was like, this is a crazy idea. The idea that you could be part of something that changes how people eat, that changes people's lives, and doing it all before you graduate university. But when I saw an idea like this, nonetheless, I did what most students do, and I turned around and I went home. I really did go on cruise control, cruising along the university highway with a bunch of other students cruising right beside me, collecting homework, handing in some assignments. But the real question is, why is it so easy to go on cruise control? And the answer lies with the fact that there's a culture of mediocrity you can sometimes feel at university. There's this idea that until you graduate, you're not really able to accomplish anything of value. And you'll hear it all the time. You can't do this, you're only a first year. You can't do this, you don't have the skills or experience. You can't do this because you're only a second year or a third year. You can't do this because engineers aren't useful until they graduate. That's, that's one we hear quite a bit. You simply can't do this. But what if you could do something crazy and insane and cool and exciting and exhilarating and just mind-blowing, absolutely mind-blowing? And the important thing I need to stress here is I'm not talking about page two of your resume cool, I'm talking about the world altering cool. I'm talking about things that really do change the world. What if you could start a company before completing introduction to finance? Or what if you could build a solar car before completing introduction to electronic devices? For two years of my life, I spent my evenings doing a mixture of watching YouTube and playing table tennis. Now, this is by far some of the most fun I've had at university without a doubt, until I started to notice something. What I started to notice was that as I was watching YouTube of my evenings, my friends were on there. They were starting companies, they were winning awards, and they were building solar cars, the one thing that stuck out to me. And that's where I started to learn that the question, what if you could, wasn't really the question after all. I realized that the problem isn't with a lack of opportunity, but rather with an apathy and conservatism that we all have when taking up these opportunities. 
So I realized the question is actually, but where do I start? Where can I start? And that's what led me into SunSwift. And at the end of my second year, I started getting involved in the team. I started off building their website, which I did a very terrible job of. I then started building some live tracking software so we could watch the car as it drove down the street. And then I started trying to refine the business team until finally after about six months of hard work, I was eventually leading the team. I was leading a team of some of the most hardworking, bright and diligent individuals I've ever met in my life and are quite possibly ever likely to meet in my life. And in July this year, 2014, me and a team of what is really now 30 of my closest friends, we broke the world record, a 26-year-old world record, for the fastest electric vehicle over a 500-kilometer distance. We smashed it, we broke it at 107 kilometers an hour when the previous record was 73 kilometers an hour. We completely changed the landscape of what it means to be an electric vehicle. We're up there with Tesla now in terms of trying to change perceptions. There are always electric and solar vehicles that could travel quite long distances and also at high speeds, but what we were really the first of is one of the first to do both, and that's really something special to us. But the record title, it's just a title. What's really important for us is the journey we all went on to get there. And now I'll start with this. Breaking a world record is not as easy as we thought it would be, right? <laughs> so. We sat down in January this year, and we said, yeah, let's do this thing. Yeah, why not? We got some time, right? So even six months out, we began to panic. We had $40,000 to raise. And who will we to raise $40,000? Half of our team lives at home. The other half of our team will consider $40,000 as three and a half years of rent. Um, that's a lot of money. I got completely blown by it. So that was a problem. We had industry and staff at the university telling us we can't do this. We don't have the money. We can't raise enough money. And although these problems aren't unique, fundraising is not a unique problem, and it's something that we're not special for having, the way we go about the solutions are really something that stands out to me is why this team is so beautiful. We had students putting on suits in between classes and heading to the city to try and establish the most basic business and sponsorship arrangements. This is us in Martin Place a couple of months ago, just even trying to raise some cash. And that's really what's special. Arguably, a few of our team members are the equivalent of business graduates or law graduates when it comes to some of the work these guys have been doing. They're not just engineers now. But it wasn't all a gradual learning curve. Some parts were actually very steep. About a night or two before we left for the record attempt, we had one important day of testing the following day. Testing was meant to start at 9 a.m. on a Tuesday. And it's about 10 p.m. on a Monday night. We're 11 hours from testing, and we think, well, okay, well, everything's good. Let's go home. Let's get a good night's rest. We try and power on the car just to make sure it's all working for the next day, um, but nothing. It was quiet, like uncomfortably quiet. Don't get me wrong. Solar cars are very quiet, um, but it was dead silent. So we panicked a little bit, and the first thing we did was we called up a few of our friends in the team, a few electrical engineering students, they come straight down to the workshop. It's already midnight at this point. They're looking for this thing called a solder bath, which is electrical engineering magic, and they can't find it. And now it's one in the morning, and it's two in the morning, you know, in the middle of the night. And if we were in a run-of-the-mill engineering company, we'd have to fill out a three-page document requesting a new item to work with. We'd have to send it off to management, wait two business days until we get approval from head office, Eventually, it would trickle back down in a couple of weeks if some of the team members haven't resigned by then. But we did what students do. Um, a couple of the guys got together in a room with some old tools, and they fixed this thing. And that was really quite something incredible. But, of course, it's a dramatic story, so we had another problem. We couldn't get the tire back on the wheel once we fixed it. Now, before you think we're an incompetent race car team that can't get a tire on, I need to stress that these are very, 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 very disagreeable tires. But by this point, it's 3.30 in the morning. We've got guys who start work in four or five hours. So we make some more phone calls. We get some other team members down there. And next thing you know, we've got people waking up, coming down to the workshop, hopping on a bus. It's 4.30 in the morning. And all I can remember is sitting around with a few guys trying to get this tire on. It's five in the, it's still dark outside, you know. And we're trying to get this tire on, and after a couple of hours of work, we eventually get it on. And it's great. 
We're ready. The day of testing is about to begin. Half the team's ready for an eight-hour day of testing following this, and the other half's going to try and go back to uni so they can fit in some class in between this crazy. And eventually, the record day crept closer. And before you know it, it was on us. Now, I want to stress, this isn't just a matter of taking the car down to a park and driving in circles for 500 kilometers. It's a matter of taking 23 students, five cars, at, to the bottom of the country, camping in tents in the cold South Australian winter, and then driving in a circle 500 kilometers. <laughs> so, this was terrifying by this point. And eventually, the record day was there. Six months of our hard work, sacrifice, the prospect of sitting up at night contemplating whether you're going to fail university because you've been working on this car, finally came about. And it was the day, it was a 4 a.m. start, by 6 a.m. we were on the track. We were covered with fog. It was a terrible day. We were running late. We were 12 minutes from cancelling. 12 minutes from cancelling after six months of hard work. We were running so late, we had no time to really test the car. And before you know it, we're trying to get the car running just blind. It's all or nothing at this point. driving in circles, we eventually crossed the finish line and we had successfully broken the record. Now, at this point, we could only ask ourselves, who, th who the hell are we, really? We're a bunch of university students who would spend the afternoon at McDonald's trying to celebrate and then spend the evening enrolling in the next semester of university. That evening, I could only think of one thing. I could only think of my friends back at home, at university and everything in between. I could think about the ones that were on cruise control, sleeping, watching YouTube and playing table tennis like I enjoyed. And all I could think about was how much I wish they could experience something like this. Now, don't get me wrong, these people I don't think have incomplete lives or are bludgers by any means. Being on cruise control does not mean you're not moving. But I wish they could experience what it's like to break a world record. Or I wish they could experience what it's like to inspire young women to take up engineering. There is so much power and beauty in being part of something that's world changing. Every week, there are, all, there are always people who want to join our team. And they always come up to me and they say, I don't think I can be part of this because I'm just a first year, or I'm just a second year, or I'm just a third year. And every time I tell them the same thing. I tell them that I now spend the majority of my life doing some of the most important work of my life with what are predominantly first, second, and third year students. To all students out there, from high school to university, all I want to say is that learning and growing is not about books and exams. It's about friends, teamwork, and being part of something bigger than yourself. University is not some obstacle to overcome to accomplish anything, but rather it's a platform upon which you can do some of the most important work of your life. Nearly all of us default to cruise control, but you don't have to. Take the wheel and go be part of something that inspires you. Thank you. Thank you.